following program is a SUTV student production. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Salisbury University, the University System of Maryland, its regents, administration, officers, employees, or representatives. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Sports Night. I'm Travis Anella alongside Matt Forney, Chris Makoviak, and Jessica Ree. Got a big weekend of Salisbury sports this past weekend. Not all great. You guys want to start with the good news or the bad news? Mm. We're starting with the bad news. <laughs> uh, <laughs> field hockey played their first round game against Rochester, and they lost 3-2. to two. Uh, So let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. Uh, first thing I want to say is Salisbury outshot them 27-6. to six. Uh, Samantha Johnson outshot them 7-6. to six. Why, why do you think they could not score? We were talking about this the past couple of shows that the defense was what would hold this field hockey team in these games because the offense was lacking. But defense gave it up in this one. And the big problem for Salisbury was their offense actually came out for this game, but they, their shots just weren't good, I guess, and didn't get in the back of the net. And that's the tough part. Their offense was actually producing, came out great after giving up a goal in the second half, came out and was, for 19 minutes really was strong. But... The shots just didn't go into the back of the end. Some days you have problems like that. I felt bad from last week. Last week we talked about how like you saw that in their motivation that they really wanted to win this game. And we both said that it was going to be a very defensive game. And unfortunately it happened. It didn't happen in Salisbury's favor. Just going off of talking about offense showing up and whatnot, scoring two goals in field hockey, you would think a much higher scoring offense like we've seen in the past in Salisbury. Just unfortunate that these seniors that you know, been to the back-to-back -back Final Fours and to you know even a national championship appearance just came up short in their senior year, and I'm sure it hurts, and it's something that you know will always be in the back of their heads going forward with their lives. Yeah, especially the way that they lost, it's got to be tough. Um, they went down one nothing, tied it up at one, then went down two to one, tied it up at two, and then Rochester had one of their five penalty corners all um, all evening and uh, deflection went into the net pretty much as time expired. Um, is it, it's it's got to hurt a little bit more because Salisbury gets so many penalty corners per game and they have trouble scoring with them. Um, how, do you, how do you think it would feel to, to end your season on giving up a goal off of a penalty corner? We have a player like Sam Johnson has taken the penalty corners for Salisbury and when she out shoots the whole entire opposing team, it doesn't feel good definitely. And for her, especially as a senior, it's just tough for them. As Matt said, we heard, especially on the last show, them talk about how they have almost gotten to the end point so many times recently that this has to be just devastating for some of these players. I would look at it as like, she would definitely, all players who are seniors this year, they would definitely feel hurt and pain of this, but they have to look back at all the uh, three years that they have accomplished here. But they'll definitely move on from it. Yeah, well, speaking of moving on, looking on, to next season, uh, they're losing Samantha Johnson and Courtney Jansen, two of their top goal scorers, Amanda Cooper, Breck Sullivan, two of their best defenders. But they are also getting back uh, Tressie Windsor, their goalkeeper, Anna Brittingham, another good defender, Becca Ronica, another top scorer. Do you think they're going to be right back in it next year? Or do you think it might be a little bit of a transition year? I think they'll struggle, just considering those key pieces that you mentioned are missing, and it'll take time like men's soccer this year with the defense to gel. But at the end of the day, they'll be fighting right up there for the national championship. They'll be in contention for the tournament, and once the tournament starts, it's anybody's game. Yeah, they'll be back. It, it's just going to take adjusting. First couple games, non-conference, they're going to need to figure out this defense. And with stars coming back, there's leadership. And when you have leadership, other players, the future players, will come up and rise again. Salisbury Field Hockey will be back next year. All right, now on to men's soccer. Also played on Saturday. Also lost on Saturday. Uh, they lost two to one to Tufts. Like you said, it was going to be tough. <laughs> yes, it was a very tough game. Um, Dennis Runicara got the uh, scoring started in the eighth minute for Salisbury. Went up one nothing. Uh, Leslie Amuna with the assist, and then um, 
couldn't get another one on the board, you know. We talked about it last week. Tufts had a outstanding defense, and you know their defense just one up Salisbury's. Drew Stadley eight saves, did all he could to keep his final year going. What what do you think? How, why do you, why couldn't um, Salisbury get up in the back of the net? You know, Tufts kept Umuna and Zengraf off the board. When you have a team that controls possession, and you're usually that team playing on the, especially in the second half, Tufts controlled the ball. So it's kind of hard to score when you don't have possession of that ball. And in soccer, usually the team that wins the game has the majority of the possession. That's what Tufts did is they controlled the second half. And Salisbury's defense was on the ropes the second half. And Staley made great saves to keep them in. Just got one by him in the lot, 60th minute. And like you said, Tufts controlled the ball most of the game. And Staley did his best, and I'm sure everyone else did in the soccer team. So it's unfortunate that it had become a loss, but Tufts was the better team at the end. And as Matt said, the, p the possession was key. Uh, the big thing that Salisbury's defense couldn't handle that they usually do a great job with is the transition play of the offense. They're going right down the field, and that's credit to Tufts. We were talking about how they had one, were averaging 1.3 goals per game. Salisbury was averaging 1.6 goals per game. It was going to come down to that first score, really. And Salisbury got on the board and got a little bit laid back there and towards the end of the first half, and Tufts was able to equalize. And from there, it was all Tufts throughout the game. It Going off that point is I feel like that goal switched the momentum because up until that point Salisbury seemed like they controlled the ball and controlled the game and then that equalizer going into halftime just switched the momentum and, and in sports momentum is huge to have on your side. Yeah, when I was watching the game and I saw Salisbury score inside 10 minutes of the game, I'm like, wow, they are going to dominate this top defense and move on to the second round. And then Tufts tied it up and then, uh, you know, Back and forth in the second half, Tufts got the goal, and then really Salisbury just couldn't really do anything for the final half hour. Um, had few chances. Tufts, great job with ball control and just keeping possession, like you guys said. For them looking to next season, uh, they are losing their head coach. You know, Jerry DiBartolo, a legend here at Salisbury University, is staying as the athletic director, but won't be the head soccer coach anymore. They're losing Drew Stadley, they're losing Matt Green, uh, they're losing you know, Michael Feeney, he's a great support player, and they're losing uh, several other, other players, but they are getting their two top goal scorers back. Um, they're gonna need Umuna and Zentgraf next year to score a lot of goals, uh, especially since they're gonna have an inexperienced goalkeeper in, in net, wouldn't you guys agree? Yeah, I would say, just like going into this year, the defense, and also Cy McNeil plays outside, he's graduated, or graduating this year. So you have a big part of your defense missing again, but even bigger is the goalie position. You don't know how you're going to rebound. And when we interviewed Coach DiBartolo about, you know, Staley for over the last three years, you know, he wasn't sure how he was going to come in and play, and he played great and kept that position. But, you know, it's, it's going to be a big question mark. All right. That's enough of the sad stuff. Good news? Yeah, good news. Salisbury University football team, um, conference champions. They played uh, Frostburg State this past Saturday. We very have some exciting highlights. game. Yeah, very exciting game. We have some highlights of that game. Very exciting fourth quarter. Yeah. So they played Frostburg State in the Regents Cup, the annual rivalry game. Seniors being honored before the game um, on senior day. We're going to skip ahead to the fourth quarter. Salisbury down 27-7. to Ryan Jones dropped back and threw it uh, down the middle. Aaron Moore with a 23-yard touchdown grab. Makes it 27-14 with 13.45 to go. Now eight minutes to go. Uh, Max Ursham is the target in the corner of the end zone, making it 27 to 21. Now Salisbury crunch time gets the ball back. 3:18 remaining. They have a fourth and ten, down by six. Isaiah Taylor with the catch up the middle keeps the drive alive. Three plays later, they have a fourth and 15. Now Ryan Jones once again drops back to pass, breaks out of the tackle there, throws it downfield, and Isaiah Taylor makes the Sports Center top ten worthy one-handed catch and runs all the way down to the 15-yard line for the first down Seagulls. Now clock ticking, under a minute to go. Ryan Jones pump fakes, throws it into the corner of the end zone, and guess who catches it? It's Isaiah Taylor for the touchdown, completing the comeback. Uh, just under, or just around 30 seconds remaining. Final play of the game for Frostburg. They're going for a 57-yard field goal. The snap there is bobbled. The kick is nowhere near being good. And Salisbury completes the comeback, comes all the way back. And look at that celebration from the Seagulls. You can just see how excited they are. They're the Regents Cup winners for the 12th straight year, and they are New Jersey Athletic Conference champions and are heading to the playoffs. Very exciting. 
very exciting fourth quarter. Chris, you were announcing the game. Uh, tell us a little bit how, how you felt, you know, in the first three quarters compared to the fourth quarter. Well, first three quarters, it's around up until two minutes left into the third quarter that finally Salisbury's offense seemed to be clicking. And it was that moment that it was, we need to score a touchdown and get some momentum going. Matt, of course, a few minutes ago, bringing up momentum, how big it is in sports. And on those highlights, you saw three passing touchdowns. Passing game is not what we see from Salisbury, but that's what shined when it needed to. And Isaiah, Isaiah Taylor coming up huge there in the clutch situation on the slant routes and then that post route uh, for that one-handed catch. Going to the playoffs when your star players can shine when they need to, that is a huge key for teams like Salisbury and potentially can get a win at uh, Cortland State this weekend. Speaking off of that, I think what swung this team this season is when, I hate to say it with injuries, we see it all the time in sports where players lose jobs or whatever, but Dunbar went down, Ryan Jones stepped in, and there's no difference in play. Team played good and they adjusted and you know they went on to win. And I'm excited for what this team has to offer for next year considering how they ended their season. Ryan Jones making that play at the end, fourth and 15. I was watching the game and I was nervous about it just because it was fourth and 15. We are not a passing team. I knew we most likely weren't going to get it if we ran the option on that. So you have to throw it up and hope for something. And Isaiah Taylor made the catch of the season. Yeah, you know, speaking of we're not a passing team, through the first seven games of the season, Ryan Jones was 30 for 69, uh, which is about 4.3 completions per game. Uh, against Wesley and Frostburg, he was 19 of 33, so average about nine and a half completions per game. Um, and against Frostburg, they had more passing yards than rushing yards, uh, 199 to 172. N something you never see. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really important that they sort of balanced out their offense heading into the playoff uh, because now all these teams are good. They all have good defenses. They know just how to stop the option. Um, now, heading in this weekend against Cortland State, do you, do you think they're going to continue to um, pass the ball like they have the past two weeks against Cortland, or do you think that they're going to try and go back to their option, uh, option ground game? Well, I think they'll start the game going with that option like we saw against Frostburg State, but if that doesn't work, the passing game will be right there. Both teams allow about the same amount of points per game, so, but SU, of course, 12 more points uh, per game from the offense. Uh, Cortland State, they limit te their opposing teams, but they've had some close ones this season, including two losses uh, in conference and two uh, overtime wins. They, they come down in clutch situations and they win, which could be a trouble spot for Salisbury, but getting that offense clicking as early as possible. So maybe going to the passing game early if the option's not working could be a, an option for Salisbury. I think Salisbury comes in with the momentum considering the comeback that they had against Frostburg State in a rivalry game to clinch you know, their automatic bid. And these two teams are familiar. They used to play in the same conference in the Empire 8, or they've played recently. And so for that fact, you got to look at it as, you know, these teams are familiar and they know what to expect from one another. But if I'm Salisbury, and the success that Ryan Jones has had the last two games, I mix in more passing in this game to keep Cortland off their feet, keep them on their toes. And like you said, Ryan Jones is definitely improving on his passing, and he trusts in Isaiah Taylor, so I don't see why they wouldn't be able to pass. Now, game is up in Cortland. That's upstate New York. That is very cold. It is going to be a very cold game on Saturday. Um, do you think that's going to affect the way Salisbury runs their offense a little bit? Absolutely. It's like only 63 degrees here right now for um, – what, is, what month are we in? November. Yes, November. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see how they play in colder weather. Yeah, and that will come into the kicking game, uh, passing game, of course. So we may see m more rushing coming on early. And we'll see how Ryan Jones handles it coming from a warmer environment. And you mentioned the kicking game. I think the battle of field position is going to determine this winner. If you can't get the height on punts or field goals, it's, you know, one missed field goal could be the end of the season. As we saw early in the season, one missed extra point is the reason why we were a two-loss team instead of a one-loss team. All right, predictions for Saturday against Cortland. I think that they can go up to Cortland and pull off the upset, at least get to the second round. Uh, what do you guys think? I think they win by three, and they have to control the ball. They can run their offense and keep Cortland's defense on the field. They win. I'll give Salisbury 
35-24 win. I think Cortland's a bit overrated after the schedule they went through. Wow. Jessica? I think they'll definitely win against Cortland. It's going to be very exciting to watch it on YouTube for Cortland's website. So hopefully they win. And we all go with Salisbury. It's like we all go here. Yeah. Uh, that's all the time that we have for tonight. Um, I'm Travis Nodella on Chris McCoviak, Matt Forney, and Jessica Ree. Have a great night, everybody.